Hi there, welcome to Grow Big Red. We are from the University of Nebraska. I'm Jonathan Larson, an entomologist. And I'm John Fesch, a horticulturist. And today we're gonna to be talking about two separate issues that are pretty important for the viewers. I'm gonna be talking about insects and where they go in the winter. Everybody's always asking questions about how do bugs survive these cold temperatures? It's an important question. Insects are poikiliotherms, which is sort of a fancy way of saying that they're cold-blooded organisms. They're the same temperature as their surroundings. Could you so, say that one more time, po please? Poikiliotherms. I like saying it. It kind of rolls off the tongue. Do you want to give it a shot? No. No? <laughs> so with these, uh, with these critters, they're the same temperature as their surroundings, okay. basically. If it's 50 degrees outside, their body is 50 degrees. If it's 10 degrees, they're 10 degrees. So they are not winter organisms. They don't like to be exposed to cold. I know that you feel very similarly. John, you try to get away as much as you can, Not right? quite as bad, but um, I certainly commiserate with, with them <laughs> on, on that level. I got Scandinavian blood, so I like it cold. I like it when it gets down into these cold temperatures. Okay. But these critters that we see sort of laid out here in front of us, most of them do not enjoy this kind of weather. So winter can be challenging for an insect. What are they going to do in order to not freeze or to avoid freezing? They have two sort of main ways of doing that. Some insects simply do die. A lot of our pests, uh, they will survive in some way, but a few select ones, things like potato leafhopper or European corn or corn earworm, these kinds of organisms at the end of the summer, whatever's around is usually killed by the winter cold. And then after that, if we are going to get them again next year, they have to ride up on the trade winds or get brought up here in some other fashion. So that's how those populations get restarted. But for the most part, they die right now. Uh, there's not too many of those around. There are some insects that like to avoid the cold though. They get far away from it, just like you do when you get on an airplane. <laughs> That's right. A very famous example of that would be the monarch butterfly. Monarchs are famous for this migratory pattern that they have throughout the North American continent. In the spring, monarchs will travel up from Mexico into the Southern United States. In the middle of the summer, they usually start making their way through here. In the fall, they end up towards Canada, and then they trek back. There's one generation that flies all the way down to Mexico. There's a grove of trees down there that they overwinter in, and then in the, they will mate and start the whole thing over again the next spring. It's kind of an amazing process. It's beautiful to watch. I don't know if you've ever seen the monarchs coming through. No, but it sounds like an incredible frequent flyer program. It is, yeah. A long distance. <laughs> lots of miles, lots of orange and black to watch. It's a very interesting thing to see. It's impressive. Yeah, uh, and it's something that makes them very famous. It's one of the reasons that people like to think of them as sort of our national insect, I okay. would say. Other insects can migrate too, the painted lady butterfly. We had an outbreak of those a couple summers ago. They will migrate through series of states. We've also got dragonflies, which not a lot of people think is a migratory insect, but the ones that we see sort of splayed out here, many of them will fly thousands of miles to get away from cold weather wow. in order to go and generate new generations elsewhere before migrating back and becoming part of our summer landscape. And so lots of insects will do that. They just fly away from where the cold is and go where the warm is. They're snowbirds. Others will avoid these cold temperatures in a, in a little more subtler fashion. They are either going to be an egg or a pupa, maybe a larva or an adult. Any of these life stages they can do this with. And it's going to be different for each species, which one it is. But they use this as a way of avoiding the cold. They dig down into something or they're coated in something so that that cold temperature can't get to the actual living organism. So one example that I have here that's an egg is this mantid egg case. We call this an uatheca. Uathecas look kind of like styrofoam insulation when you spray that around your window. Sure. Kind of looks yeah. similar. Yeah. Inside of here are a couple hundred, maybe 300 eggs of baby mantids, and those are gonna hatch out in the spring and they're gonna eat each other for a little while before becoming adults. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the, the fittest. Insects yeah. are tough, you know, they gotta yeah. do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And they are in here insulated in this nice foam material from the cold. It's also good to be an egg in the winter because you don't have to move, you don't have to eat, you don't have to do a whole lot of anything. Everything is well stocked and well taken care of. So a lot of insects are gonna be these eggs over the winter. Some of them are larva. A good example of a larva that overwinters is a Japanese beetle grub. Mm. They will bore down into the dirt, into the soil. I know you don't like the word dirt. <laughs> they will go further down into the soil to get away from that frost line. They can go up to 10, 12 inches deep in order to avoid that cold. That way they never get frozen. Some others that do this would be emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. They spend the winter as a larva underneath that bark. The bark helps to protect them from those cold temperatures as well. 
Some of them will do it as a pupa in this container here. This is a tomato hornworm moth, those big green caterpillars that you get on your tomato plants right. in the summer. Right. This is what they pupate into. So this is the in-between stage between the caterpillar and the adult. This pupa doesn't move a whole lot. If I kind of hold it up like this, it might, see how it kind of squirms around? Just a little. Just a little bit. That's its only defense mechanism is kind of wiggles its butt at you so you might not want to eat it. What's this uh, appendage on the top? Right here? Yeah. That's the mouth. Okay. So a, a moth or a butterfly has that proboscis that they feed with. Right. This is its proboscis forming. A pupa is very interesting. All the goo that is the insect is on the inside and this shell will open up and underneath is the moth. Okay. or the butterfly, okay. depending on what species you're talking so about. So this will turn into a butterfly this in about will, two this months? This will be a big hawk moth. Okay. It's, a, uh, it's a nice looking moth. They're very wide when their wings are angled out. They've got some nice spots down the side. The pupa is also interesting. If you take a close look, you can see the antenna, an impression of them along the edge oh. and the eyes uh -huh. up here right. on the top. Right. Right. Just barely see Just it. Bar it's a very faint outline of yeah. these things. And the little dots down the side, that's how it breathes. Those are called spiracles. Okay. So this is down in the soil. Here in my container, it was in this wood shaving material. Mm. I've got a little hornworm farm. I've raised about 100 of these in you my would. office. You, as you would, see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is just one of the uh, several dozen pupa that I have. But this pupal form is nice to be in over the winter because, again, you don't have to feed. You don't have to move. These are buried in the soil, again, to avoid those cold temperatures. So it's a nice overwintering strategy. Some of them make the cocoon over them, a hair and silk mixture that helps to insulate them from the cold. So lots of pupa are hiding out in the winter and those will hatch out in the spring to adults, which will start the whole thing over next year. One of the reasons that we never seem to run out of bugs. Mm. Some of them actually overwinter as adults though. And I've got a few examples of this. The adults are typically these insects that we call hemipterans or true bugs. They have that needle-like mouth part on the front. They have interesting wings, usually half membranous, half leathery. These insects spend their summer developing and mating and getting together. And then in the fall, there's a lot of adults. And these adults are gonna look for areas to overwinter. They often use logs or rocks or turfy areas. They'll get down into those and hide out. But some of them are using our homes. They see the house as this big, healthy tree that's got internal heating, right? right, right. And then you can get right. inside and, and hide out for the winter and not have to worry about anything. Maybe this time of year in a garage? A maybe, garage would be good. A shed. Space, they yeah. love attics and soffits. Yeah. They'll get into the wall space, actually. They'll get down into there. They just get into window sills, anywhere that there's a nice tight space in order for them to just kind of hang out. These ones are called conifer seed bugs, and they have these like big calves on the back <laughs> and if you have a lot of pines or other conifer type trees on your property you may end up with some of these feeding on those trees on the pine cones and needles and then in the fall they're going to start trickling inside and you'll see them accumulate in lights or underneath lamps or even near heating ducts. Well with that in mind is there any need to do any sort of elaborate control measures, spray insecticides, anything like that? It's tough to do insecticides for these particular insects because they're not feeding, they're not always crawling in the same areas that we spray the insecticides to keep mm. insects out. So a perimeter spray around the foundation of the home and around windows is going to help but timing is key. Mm. If you do it in the beginning of August, probably not going to help you very much. Mm. If you wait until the leaves really start falling off, that's the time where you might get some control. Those residues only last one to three weeks on the house. So it's gotta be there for these to crawl through as they try to get inside. Once they're inside, it's not a good idea to spray for yeah. them. It's best to just vacuum them up or use a broom, throw them outside, let them freeze to death. You can curse at them from inside where it's warm. <laughs> so here in late January, that would be the time would be just to do some vacuuming and some brushing into a dustpan and, and not be too worried about actually uh, doing any real aggressive control. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Soapy water, that'll kill some of them if okay. you find them in big groups. Okay. Suck them up with the hose attachment yeah. or the vacuum. It can be fun to watch them ping around yeah. in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, very good. What else you got to show us? Well, we've got some other insects hidden over here. These are some brown marmorated stink bugs. There are other ones that in, they will overwinter indoors. They are an invasive species. Another famous example would be a multicolored Asian lady beetle. They also overwinter inside and are an invasive. 
They're in, these ones are interesting because during the summer, they're a pest of tomatoes mm -hmm. and peppers and corn, lots of other crops that we grow, berries in particular and apples. Yeah. But in the winter, they want an overwintering spot. So they get inside. They are a little different than some of our native stink bugs. They have this kind of gray belly. And if you look at their antenna, this one is missing his antenna, but they have white stripes on them. And they're called marmorated because they're covered in these little brown dots mm -hmm. all over their body. These ones, when they get inside, they can smell. They're not going to eat or mate once they're inside, but they do create this musky odor, mm. and it can be annoying to some people. And if you see big pockets of them, again, spray them with soapy water or vacuum them up. We do see those as pests in the vegetable garden in the summertime, though, and uh, usually it's on, like you said, the berries or the tomatoes. Or Do you want to smell them? Yeah, I'll give, uh, it, a, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a hit. It is quite malodorous. Mal <laughs> yeah, and it's not awful, but I, it's a little bit musky. It's, it's yeah. musky, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what we associate with a lot of these. These yeah. uh, conifer seed bugs are quite musky. The multicolored Asian lady beetle also has kind of a musky odor, and sometimes people develop allergies to those. So that's one reason that you'd want to get them out of the house. Okay. After that, we've got some insects that will not just avoid the freeze, they can actually survive it. Some of them produce their own antifreeze inside their body, ethylene glycol-like compounds that stop ice crystals from forming. Very handy thing to have if you can't survive the cold. Sure. Other insects can direct ice formation within their body. They can actually control it and form it in areas of fatty tissue. That way it doesn't damage any important organs. It's in these non-essential areas. And as those ice crystals grow, it doesn't destroy anything in the body. And then when they thaw out, they just start crawling around and they're happy as a clam. So there's a lot of amazing things that insects can do and this is one of them. I think it's really neat that they essentially make things that we put in our car <laughs> and they can make it in their own body to help themselves survive. And it's just one of the wonders of, of entomology, one of those things that we really like to see them do. All right, well, pretty thorough. Uh, explanation and sum summarization and like you said insects have been around as least as long as we have or, oh yeah or much sure. longer yeah, even. Long so we're never going to do away with them I think the best idea is just to manage them properly and to do it in kind of a common sense way yep and that's what one of the things you do on a daily basis is try to help us and do research at the university and then transfer that information out to uh, the citizenry of, of the states of Nebraska, Iowa, around the Midwest. Absolutely. Okay. Exclude them, spray them with water when you can, and uh, you won't have anything to worry about. Well, vacuuming is another. Vacuuming I, I, I is, like the vacuum. Vacuuming is a big deal. Suck them up <laughs> with the vacuum. All right. <laughs> well, that's going to wrap it up for segment number one on what insects do in the wintertime. They can be pretty, uh, pretty intelligent as far as uh, how they can adapt and escape the, hold, uh, escape the cold. We'll shift gears here a little bit and talk a little bit about other winter activities in the landscape. We'll be talking a little bit about dealing with all that ice that we have out there that Mother Nature supplies. Welcome back to Grow Big Red. I'm John Fesch with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. This is my colleague. Jonathan Larson. I'm an entomologist with the university. And I'm a horticulturist. And we work together a lot. And today for the program, we first started talking about what bugs do in the wintertime. And now we're going to talk about what humans do in the wintertime. <laughs> and hopefully that's not slip on the ice. And uh, that can be a problem from a human standpoint. It can also be a problem when it comes to protecting our plants. And when we try to prevent ourselves from slipping and falling on the ice, uh, some things we can be a little overdone and we can be a little aggressive with the products we use. Um, and sometimes that can have a damaging effect on the plants nearby because they can damage them. A lot of them are salt-based and that just seems to suck the water right out of, uh, out of the plant material, out of turf, out of um, ground covers, out of trees and shrubs, um, anything kind of low to the ground, but even big trees too. For the most part, we, we really focus on the ground covers, the lawns, and uh, the, the smaller trees and shrubs as far as what can be susceptible to damage. So again, the first thing is we want to be safe ourselves, and that's probably more important than any plant we might want to grow. And so we think about what could we put on. The first thing you think about is grabbing a bag of ice melt. We have a couple examples right here. I'll, uh, you know, a lot of times now these days where you've got two choices. You've got the immediately aggressive products, and then you've also got earth-friendly products, which is nice to have that. But really the, the proof uh, or the details, the devil is in the details, so to speak, 
And regardless of how pretty or whatever is on the bag, you always want to turn it over and see what's in the bag. And I'll just direct your attention right here. And you have to remember a little bit of chemistry when you go to uh, figure this out. Uh, so this product is a mixture of KCL. Do you remember what that is? Potassium uh, chloride. Potassium chloride, very good. And NaCl, sodium, sodium chloride. So potassium and, and sodium chloride. What we don't know is how much or, or the percentage of each in a bag. Just by the name Earth Friendly, I would uh, sort of think it's along the lines of at least being half and half, but what we know about potassium chloride is that um, it's a little bit caustic and sodium chloride is even more caustic. So we just want to make sure that we're not using too much of it. And the same is true with this other product. And we look again for the back of the bag. And um, we've got, um, this one's a little bit different product. This one is, again, sodium chloride. But also, um, uh, this one, there are products called uh, magnesium uh, acetate. This one is magnesium chloride hexaacetate. So these are just different products that uh, can be used. So um, there, there are uh, various products that can be used for that purpose of melting the ice. Uh, pretty much for the most part, the claims that they talk about are melting ice to a certain degree or a certain temperature, zero, five below, 10 below, something along those lines. And for the most part, that works out pretty well. Um, the thing is, it's a matter of density and how much you want to use. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the site. If you're on a little bit of a hillside, here we are in River City, and most people have kind of a slopey part of their landscape that they want to take care of. That would be the bad one to fall down. That would be the bad one to fall down. It would be like a skating rink yeah. almost. So and those, those are where you tend to have a lot of, uh, a lot of ice melt put down. <coughs> also the usage. Um, I was at a, recently at an um, orthopedic rehabilitation center, and this is where a lot of people are walking around very gingerly because they had some knee surgery or something like that. And oh my gosh, it looked like they had spread mulch uh, with all this stuff. You're crunching as you walk along because they just cannot take the risk of anyone falling. Uh, while they're on that facility. All of that to say that that's going to be corrosive to that, that uh, concrete, especially if it's new concrete, as well as damaging to the plant material near, nearby. The, again, the turf, the uh, landscape plants, uh, the ground covers, anything that's in that smaller area is going to be possibly damaged. All right, and when you're using these products, I always recommend um, something like this, uh, a little bit of uh, protection for your hands. If you've ever used it without that, you'll notice your hands feel a little bit... They get crusty afterwards. Crusty. <laughs> and sometimes just melt because uh, there can be kind of a, just a slimy substance all over your hands. And while that's not particularly damaging, it's just you never want to take the risk. So I always put on some gloves, preferably ones without holes in yeah. them like these do. But it's that. nice to have some nice rubber gloves that do a good job of that. We, we see that all the time with pesticides, too. Absolutely. And uh, butyl rubber gloves work well for that. Nitrile gloves and work well for that. And it warns you on the back to do this as okay. well. Okay. Right here, read the big red That's right. warning, or in this case, the <laughs> big yellow warning. It always is a good idea. So what happens to your concrete if you use this on there? You mentioned some causticity. What would be the problem there? Most likely what's going to happen if you use too much of this is it's going to start crumbling or it's going to start flaking. It kind of depends on the, the, how the concrete was poured. Um, I just had some concrete poured recently and the concrete person put some fibers in it and it said it would help it stick together a little bit and make a little bit more resistant to damage from, uh, from salt and ice melt products. Um, but it, either way, it can still happen just because it's corrosive and it'll tend to break it apart. If nothing else, it'll generally shorten the life of the concrete. But when it comes to the plant material, what it does is, in addition to the melting of what's ever on the top of the, the turf grass or the ground cover, it will actually dehydrate. It'll pull water out in order to melt that area and turn it back into a liquid. And then, of course, it might freeze again at night. One thing I want to bring up as an alternative would be the use of sand in addition to the ice melt. There's really no way to uh, sort of replace this completely or to completely do away with, um, with the ice melt product. It is to um, simply dilute it, if you will. And sand really helps a lot with that. 
Uh, for the most part, sand, if you have some leftover playground sand or, or have a, I found it helpful to have a handy bucket next to the ice melt. It's hard to have a, a handful of sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of runs away with you, see, yeah. it just kind of runs away. But um, it, if you use it about 50-50, we found that over the years that this works really well, and that way you're only using half as much material in the landscape itself. So mixing it will give, still give you that traction or, or the gription. I've heard pro, mm. ad, pro athletes use that term, gription. Coach, I couldn't get any gription. You know, <laughs> it's like they don't care. They want you to perform. But anyway, can, you know, but we as humans want gription or, or traction on concrete, and the sand helps us get there, especially if it's brand new concrete. Again, uh, the concrete person who installed it in my, uh, my driveway told me, hey, don't use any ice melt at all. Just use sand. Um, now, an, another people sometimes will suggest using kitty litter uh, or calcined clay-like material. That can get kind of messy, uh, and then you track it all into the house. You can track the sand in the house, too, but it's much easier to vacuum up the sand than it is the, the kitty litter. But again, the product choice is yours. It's still it's lesser amounts of the uh, particular uh, debris and uh, melting from the, uh, from the, uh, the, the ice melt yeah. products themselves. Plus, if it's sand, you can pretend you just got back from the beach. <laughs> oh, you have an imagination, don't you? A <laughs> couple other things here we want to talk about. Um, and this is really from the standpoint of uh, avoidance of, of damage. Um, you, you probably have noticed what we have in front of us here. And these are strap-on devices for your shoes. You can buy these on the internet or in some local hardware stores. And these are just products that uh, you can actually put on. And these actually are my size. They yeah. fit on me. You, yours would probably be a little a, bit a little larger. A little bit more Sasquatch yeah, size. Yeah, a little bit larger. But they actually <laughs> work pretty well. And it's not like you can go running in these shoes. You just have to kind of gingerly walk around. But again, if you have a, a slope in an area, you really want some, some traction. And in addition to the sand, this is one way to help you get that. And so uh, just these are worth it. I think these cost like $15, $20. And they look a little funny. But boy, when you're starting to slide down the, the hill, this is when you wish you, you had something like that. That's so just cool. another little hint that you might want to think about. Another thing is really more the technique, and that's why we have the shovel. Jonathan, you're going to demonstrate oh, to us. Oh, cool. Uh, I should have probably started with this, but the first thing you want to think about, actually it makes sense either before or after. The other thing you want to think about is when you're clearing off all the ice and snow after a snowfall event, it's wise not to put the snow in the same area all the time. So in the studio here, this is a, uh, a studio like you might expect in most television studios, we have one, two, three, four cameras, and some places you might have one over here. So uh, think of the camera as a place where you would deposit snow and ice. You would not always want to put the snow and ice from the whole driveway right here, okay? You would want to spread it out here, over by that camera, over by that camera, over by that camera, and try to be diffuse in your snow deposition process. So as you go about scooping and slushing, okay, we're gonna have a little demonstration here now. Okay, over here, like over there, over that way, that way, over, over that over way, there. that way. So I gotta walk around though, right? <laughs> well, you, you I can't be lazy and do this. That's right. So you have to move <laughs> it around. The point is, the more you put it in one particular location, the more concentrated it's gonna be. And if it was just ice and snow, that would be a problem in itself. But if you also add the uh, the, the ice melt to it, that exacerbates the problem. Uh, putting just the snow and ice in one particular area can be a problem because, again, it gets really tall. What happens over a period of time is that excludes oxygen from the soil. And our landscape plants do have oxygen or do need oxygen over the wintertime, just like we do as, as humans. And so if you continually pile that up well, dur during our typical winter, we have freezing and thawing and very cold weather, that'll form as an ice layer and then just be, uh, it'd be like ice on a lake. There's no way to get water uh, to get oxygen down to the plant below it. And what will happen is that once that breaks apart in the spring, there'll be big dead spots. Like this area here will be entirely dead because you've piled snow upon itself. Uh, and then more ice and snow and more ice and snow. And that will cause problems. Then if you add to it the deposition of not just the ice and snow, but also the uh, salty slush uh, from the uh, ice melt products, that even makes it worse. So that's certainly something to avoid as well avoiding the uh, deposition of the ice and snow, and then also the salt and slush itself. So using all these things together makes sense. And what we can do is help ourselves as humans and then help our plants in the landscape avoid damage through the winter and then you can have a good healthy landscape in the spring. All right, all right. 
Well, I think that's going to wrap us up here for the two things. We talked about taking care of insects and just knowing what they do in the winter and how they go through the average uh, winter and how they avoid damage to themselves. And then also how we can avoid damage to ourselves and also damage to the plants and turf and lawn in the landscape. You just have to use a little bit of common sense and try to get a little bit of more information. If you do want more information, uh, we can always help you out with that. Or you could just contact Grow Big Red at growbigred.unl.edu. That's us. Uh, we have uh, information on our blog website, and we also have videos and um, a lot of other helpful information. We have a podcast. We have an audio podcast. Audio you can podcast. Listen to, you could listen to. That kind of entertainment. So lots of good information for you available from the University of Nebraska Extension. I'm John Fesh, and this is Jonathan Larson, and we're available to help you whenever you need trouble. Our phone number 402-444-7804. Have a good week.